welcome back from your breakouts from the break. We're happy to have you back to the main stage. And um, I'm really excited to, to introduce you to two men I admire deeply, not only for who they are as individuals, but for the generosity to which they offer their gifts and their wisdom to the world. The next conversation is titled Mindfulness and Technology, The Path Forward. Don Kabat-Zinn is the founder of MBSR, Mindfulness-Based Stress Reduction, and known for his work bringing mindfulness into the mainstream of medicine and society. Prasan Harris is the co-founder and president of the Center for Humane Technology, whose mission it is to catalyze a human future by reframing the insidious effects of per persuasive technology, exposing the runaway systems beneath, and deepening the capacity of everyday leaders and global decision makers to take wise action. I present to you, Don and Tristan. Enjoy. Thanks so much, Michelle. It's a delight hey, John. to be here with you, Tristan. A delight. It's my, my pleasure. It is so good to be with you again. It's a, really a shame we were just remarking backstage uh, all the times that we've gotten to meet backstage at Wisdom um, before going out in front of the audience and there's a certain room feel there that um, anyway, we'll, we'll be replicating as best we can here. It's good to see you. Yeah, and it's a big topic, a uh, huge yeah. topic. And uh, I'm really looking forward to engaging with you about it because it's so enormous and so terrifying, really, when you wrap your mind around it even a tiny little bit. Um, it's really hard to know how to approach it as a single human being or even a networked human being. And uh, maybe I could start out by, you know, I've watched the social dilemma any number of times. And, uh, and I was really struck that in the first minutes of it, you have a whole bunch of people who help to create these various kinds of uh, platforms actually articulate what was the problem. And I thought one of the strokes of genius, and there are many strokes of genius in that movie, was that everybody kind of, you know, froze up that it was not so easy to actually voice exactly what the problem is. And you needed an entire movie and dramatization and multidimensional frame in order to convey it. And I think the impact has been enormous as I understand it, that, that the, uh, the emotional impact, certainly just watching it myself has been huge. But my understanding is that over a hundred million people have watched it on Netflix. I hope that goes up by a factor of a hundred. I mean, because we yeah. really need a scale that's uh, really the entire planet. So um, just a pleasure to be in conversation with you about this kind of thing. Uh, John, well, thanks. Yes. it's. Uh... We, you and I were, were chatting a bit before, you know, about, about film and, and the impact and, and just to state um, an updated number there, because I think we did do a small session for some folks in the Wisdom 2.0 community. Um, I think it was three or four weeks after the film had come out and it really is remarkable. The film has, has broken records uh, for Netflix for documentaries. I think it's the second biggest documentary in terms of total viewership of all time for Netflix. Um, and it's been seen by, I think we're approximating close to 125 million or so people now in 190 countries and in 30 languages. And, and I think to, to underline that for a second, um, you know, this is a global problem that affects everyone and it affects everyone in an intimate way um, because it's, you know, whether it is that we've been talking to senior leadership and defense or national security or the Air Force recently, and they'll still talk to us about how the issue is affecting their children, right? Which is just the human level of how this is affecting them or how they find themselves uh, addicted to their phones or sort of unable to put it down and the, the sort of anxiety loops and that, it, that it kind of generates and creates. But, you know, it's, it's really a pleasure to be talking to you about it because I think that what differentiates the film and the diagnosis that's offered in the film is one that's kind of rooted in your tradition, which is mindfulness, because how would you know that it is doing all of these things to the human psyche if we don't have the sort of perch in our own minds that we can stand on top of and examine and sort of witness uh, the effects. Like I actually find that my ability 
to speak to and diagnose and even figure out what is exactly it doing is just literally uh, coincident with how aware can I be of what my own, own mind is doing when I'm using and watching technology sort of play out in front of my eyes. And so it's interesting that um, obviously in some ways the problem is um, a technical one, but in many ways it's really kind of a, a human one. Um, and it is about uh, the universal human instincts that are inside of all of us that um, don't define us, but because those weaknesses are there, those, those vulnerabilities are there, if we're not aware of them, um, then they will be the, the, the place where derangement will occur. They will be the place of extraction. In the same way that we have an extractive energy economy that preys upon sucking you know, oil out of the ground, we have an extractive attention economy that preys on um, using human weaknesses to be the extraction points for getting human attention and predictable human responses out, whether it's outrage to create a predictable response um, or it is um, you know, tribalism or disgust these, these root vices, or in the case of, you know, children, uh, social validation or rewards, or in the case of, um, you know, young boys at pornography, the, the ability to sort of 24 seven surround a human mind in an adversarial environment where their mind's weaknesses are available for anyone in the sort of app ecosystem to play with uh, is really the, the, the core issue. But the, the hope that I get is just that, um, I think that the film's impact is in creating self-awareness at an internet level about the internet. Like it, I think that we were all trapped in it. And I think that the film is kind of creating an awareness of what that trap is. And there's a shared now understanding up here for those who've seen the film about what used to be sort of what we were all embedded within. And if you think about the process of sort of developmental psychology, it's about being able to make object what was the subjective experience from I am anxious to I'm up here and I can notice that there's anxiety happening from exactly. man, the world has gone crazy. I'm seeing craziness everywhere to I'm up here. There's actually a calm set of minds who are able to witness the internet inside of it with the craziness is happening. Mm -hmm. But the craziness is a, is a set of selected events in the same way that our brain is selecting for certain thoughts to kind of come out. Um, almost anything you could say that's in the social dilemma, you could say just about uh, the human mind overall in a way, that's you know, true, instead of deleting your notifications. Except that there's a trillion dollar industry that's driving it and extracting it in such a way that we, your image of the puppets, uh, you know, the fingers, a small number of programmers actually controlling, you know, billions of people's minds and their view of reality and then feeding them whatever, whatever nurtures that particular more and more and more hits or more and more <coughs> likes or more and more time on you know, so that nobody's actually realized that, that everybody who Googles something or other doesn't get the same thing. You know, the point was made that right. if you go to, uh, you know, Wikipedia and you look up something, everybody gets the same something out of the encyclopedia yes. online. But if you Google something, it's not that way. And so we're being manipulated in ways that we can't even know we're being man manipulated. So the question to come back to what you said about attention is abs absolutely critical. Uh, you know, you have these phrases. What's you, what's the name of your podcast? Uh, oh, your undivided attention. Your yeah. undivided attention. So there you go. Now we're not used to undivided attention under any circumstances. That has to be cultivated, kind of like a muscle. You exercise the muscle, mm -hmm. and you you can actually. Uh, nurture undivided attention. And that might be a real uh, immunization to some of the toxicity and the addictive qualities of the web. But you're also, uh, I think, right on target in terms of pointing to attention as the interesting thing about attention is that it is the doorway to, or the gateway to awareness. And human right. awareness that's why we're having this at Wisdom 2.0, that we're really talking about wisdom. We're talking mm -hmm. about the human capabilities that have not been fully developed so far on the planet. And what I understand, one of your points is that, hey, we're running out of time. The world is literally on fire. And as you and also Yuval uh, Noah Harari say, that maybe there's only five years or at the most 10 years before the algorithms are so instantiated that it's even beyond, you know, sort of surveillance capitalism. It's just 
you know, a fact that nobody will know how to actually unravel. So mm -hmm. the stakes, as I understand them, are unbelievably high. And uh, so I love that we can bring these two elements of ultra high tech and algorithms and the kinds of things that, you know, persuasive technologies together with ancient wisdom to traditions that actually are, experience a certain, are experiencing a certain kind of renaissance at this moment on the planet at a planetary level. And so what might have seemed like just a kind of side product of new age, you know, uh, sort of uh, self-involvement turns out mm -hmm. to be the potential liberative possibility, not the only right. one, but a, a fundamental one for uh, immunizing ourselves, so to speak, as a species or waking up as a species to the name we gave ourselves so that we actually don't surrender our analog being without mm -hmm. even knowing we've lost it and it would never come back. There's a lot, there's a lot there um, in what you just shared. Yeah. Um, I mean, you could say, that's why I honestly, I love this community and it's really a shame we can't be physically in the wisdom 2.0 space because the, the reason why I've gone every, year. every year and next year, yeah, we'll definitely be back is, you know, it's, I just love being around in my favorite moments. Um, sometimes I'm working on this is getting to sit in a circle with you and maybe Byron Katie and, uh, you know, Paul Hawken and, and have these kind of brain trusts that's sort of applying these insights about the interiority of our experience and, and, and then using that as the tool to diagnose what's wrong with technology. And I think that's very different than so much of that policy conversation. I mean, we could have a whole conversation about what's happening right now in the Biden administration in Congress. Just, just two days ago, um, there was a hearing um, in, in Congress with a Jack Dorsey, the CEO of Twitter, the CEO of Facebook, Mark Zuckerberg, and Sundar Pichai all testified in front of Congress. And a lot of people were using the social dilemma as the basis for the questions that they were asking. And so, um, gosh, there's so much we can get into, but I guess what I'm trying to say is the, um, there's a lot, I get a lot of hope from seeing how the film has, has reframed the questions that we're asking. Um, you know, if you think about privacy being the primary thing, well, if we got our perfect privacy world where our data is protected and our privacy is protected, it doesn't change that we still get shortening of attention spans, mass polarization, tribalism, uh, breakdown of a shared truth or shared reality, more extremism, more kind of conspiracy theory rabbit holes that are the perfect one for you. That's the personalization. All of those effects still remain because it's not the privacy problem. It's not the, um, the regulate tech problem. We really have a consciousness awareness kind of issue, which is, can we be more aware of what the technology is doing to us then how quickly it is deranging the, the one instrument we have to detect the derangement. So we have to have a primacy of our ability to stay aware of what those changes are. Um, and uh, I, you know, I, I think we're, I think it's opened that doorway. I mean, you and I were talking, there's so many different to give people some hope, which I'm sure we can probably more, more end with, but just that there are a lot of pieces moving now that have me excited. We found out recently that the, the film was required viewing for a bunch of people and senior leadership at the Pentagon. Um, we know there's many heads of state uh, who've seen it and actually um, sent multiple emails to everyone that they know that they should see it. I just heard that Nancy Pelosi, after a thing we did for the Democratic Caucus last week and screening for all 50 members of Congress, that they were recommending that everyone in Congress see the film. And it's become kind of a shared touch point of a problem statement that is sort of in this weird way underneath everything else because your attention is the foundation of your life. And for a society, your attention is the foundation of what your society is thinking about and can do. And so this is why, you know, this conversation with you is so profound because you are one of the, you know, leading uh, voices and experts in how our attention, attention, I was gonna say attention can be uh, deranged and, and what it takes to kind of return to something underneath that. Um, well, it's, it's really uh, uplifting to hear that uh, because um, the pandemic has shown us some things about the, that most people never get training in if they haven't trained as scientists and understanding what exponential even means. Uh, and, you know, the back half of the chessboard, so to speak, that there, you know, when things are going exponential, there is mm -hmm. a point at which they are uh, become impossible, almost impossible to contain. And the beauty is that 
we can have positive exponential as well as negative exponential. And in order to sort of uh, deal with this problem, we're going to have to have an exponential buy-in to a new way of understanding how to be human on the planet. And that's what I was referring to when I said that we gave ourselves the name, the species name Homo sapiens sapiens, which literally means the species that knows and is it knows that it knows or and not, say, it knows that it knows, exactly. and not cognition and metacognition, but awareness and meta awareness. Mm -hmm. So Lin Linnaeus gave us that moniker, but we haven't quite lived our way into it. And one of my hopes with this intersectionality between wisdom and high tech is that we'll actually um, wake up to the possibility of understanding and learning to live our way into our analog lives fully, you mm -hmm. know, because we haven't begun to understand what it means to be fully human. We haven't begun to understand the beauty of what our brains actually do. They're organs of continual change and adaptation and, and a deep, deep insight and then deep inquiry into the nature of like who we are beyond name and form and all of those kinds of things. These are kind of like the finishing touches of our analog evolution that's millions of years in the making. And if it's interrupted by algorithms that a few hundred coders have put together that then uh, are you know, sort of machine learning, so no, no humans are involved with it. This is a kind of all hands on deck on spaceship earth moment. It's, it's like mm -hmm. global warming, it's at that level of magnitude and it really has to be a global problem, as I understand it, too, a global solution, as I understand it, because there are like people, as we can see, who have very different worldviews about what game we're even in. And if mm -hmm. we don't understand that there, not everybody has our goodwill at heart, then we're not talking about some kind of naive kumbaya kind of approach to things, but actually a very hard nosed, clear eyed, highly a uh, discerning way of connecting with our multiple intelligences to further life on this planet in a way that causes the least harm and therefore is ethical, absolutely ethical, and optimizes well-being and freedom, dare I say, you know, and wisdom, all these practices, meditation practices, they're all called liberative practices. And it's not mm -hmm. by accident, it's for a very mm -hmm. real reason. So the fact that we can bring these worlds together the way Soren and Wisdom 2.0 has been doing for well, a decade or more, it's really rather extraordinary. And um, so I'm glad to hear that you're hopeful because you've looked so deeply into the abyss that uh, it gives me a great deal of hope to, to say yes to let's actually mobilize our resources on every level that we can mobilize them yeah. And um, maybe articulate one other thing I want to bring up just very briefly is that over and over and again in the movie, they talk about the people who did it talk about being hired to monetize Facebook or to monetize Google or whatever. It's so monetize. And they did a fantastic job of monetizing it to suck trillions and trillions of dollars into their own you know, pockets, very small number of people at hacking the brains of virtually everybody on the planet. Mm -hmm. And the damage that has been caused is up to this point is huge. So how do we, let's take a medical or a public health perspective, you know, given the pandemic and so forth, and MBSR was always that way. How do we move the bell-shaped curve of humanity as a whole towards greater levels of wisdom and sanity and ethical behavior uh, so that we don't spend, you know, the next hundred years killing off our potential as a species for actually surviving our own precocity and total ignorance. Well, yeah, again, there's so much in what you just shared. Um, I, I think there's a key line in the film from, um, from Justin Rosenstein, uh, who's the co-inventor of the like button, runs an organization called One Project. And um, it actually comes from a shared mentor of ours, uh, Daniel Schmachtenberger. Um, and uh, the line is, Look, so long as a whale is worth more dead than alive, and a tree is worth more as two by fours and lumber than as a living tree. Um, 
you know, and we only have so many trees out there and we need the Amazon and we need the forest for climate change. You can't have a system of infinite growth wired to a system in which trees are worth more dead than alive and we need to clear out for the cattle and you keep going and you end up with sort of an irreversible collapse you can't get back from. That's a hard problem though, to get people's heads wrapped around in kind of a global consciousness level. People have their daily concerns to, to, to contend with. So that feels kind of, um, it's true, it's real, but it feels kind of out there. What's interesting about this problem is that in this case, we are the whale, we're the tree. Our mind is the very thing that is worth more as instead of our aliveness and our consciousness, which I can say in a community like this is sort of, you know, whatever consciousness is that feels alive, it is the, the, that is worth more as a dead slab of predictable human behavior uh, than it is as a living consciousness or choice-making or sense-making. Um, because when you flick your finger and you say, I'm gonna just flick one more time because I've got something else to do. And then you flick and says, oh, that's pretty good. And then you get drawn in. What happened was you had a kind of aliveness, a kind of possibility space. There was something that could have happened. There was a moment of choice in between. Right. And then you go in one level deeper and essentially what you didn't realize in that moment is it was playing chess against your mind or making a prediction about the thing that would cause that next moment to not be your living free choice, breathing, uh, living breathing moment of choice, but to instead be the predictable, my eyes hollow out, glaze over and I start doing this. That zombification, we are worth more when we're in that state. So we have to recognize a conflict between our economic system and economic interest and what is sustainable because if everybody was outside reconnecting with themselves or meditating or on a camping trip with their friends or hiking you know, out there in the world, that's not very profitable for Google or for Facebook in the same way that if, as you know, from your work, we were talking about this a little bit in our, in our pre-call, um, you know, it, it's more profitable to put someone on a subscription plan for, you know, drugs than to do mindfulness-based stress reduction in terms of to the pharma industry. Right. So how is it in both cases that we can have the natural ways of us being ourselves be, I don't even want to say profitable, but how do we make sure we protect uh, those, those forms? Because in the same way that we put, we say, yeah, we, of course, if you let our economic lo logic run over every single national park and forest in the world, we're going to end up with no trees and you get the Wally sort of future that, you know, so many thinkers and public intellectuals have, have hypothesized. Um, but in, in this case, we're, we're going to sort of mow down all of the, the life world of human consciousness and end up with the, the dead world of predictable human vices. You know, in, in, in this industry, Reid Hoffman, this, the founder of LinkedIn, said the most successful social media products are the ones that tap into one or more of the seven deadly sins. Um, and the more of the seven deadly sins you use, greed, uh, sloth, uh, I forgot all of, all of them. Yeah. Um, yeah. They, they each correspond to a very successful social media product. Um, and, you know, while we want to create more conscious business products that are, you know, or sort of conscious technology products that have business models that are more aligned, there is a point at which left unregulated, it is simply more in the economic interest to mow down everything. And we just know that that logic is unsustainable fundamentally. And what has me more almost excited is that the social dilemma takes this abstract thing about the economic system and the finite planet, which is so big. And it seems like we've got plenty of time left to go keep mining the trees and they'll keep growing back or whatever. Versus now, when I look at my kids, I, I don't have kids, but if I did, you look at your kids and you see them trapped in this, this machine and you can actually associate that with, that's them being turned into the dead lumber, right? That's, you can now see that same economic system in a, in a, in a more intimate part of your life. It, you can feel it and see it and taste that problem, which I think gives me more hope for more people understanding that fundamental conflict yeah. and what's possible that we need to transition to. Um, and I do think that the film briefly touches people to that, to that understanding. Um, and tilts us in the direction of, uh, you know, given what you said uh, about the Congress, you know, why is this not regulated? Why is this not understood and then regulated like any other business. And some businesses are outlawed. They're just simply not allowed because the profit would be uh, grotesquely uh, unethical. Uh, so why can't we do this here? And where we're all stakeholders, so to speak. Uh, right. And mention, bringing up children is a very big part of it because uh, anybody who has children, including I think Steve Jobs was, you know, and Steve, 
you know, that he, he wouldn't let his own kids, as the story goes, anywhere near his uh, technology. And that's addictive on the hardware side, you know, out of the yeah. beauty of the construction and so forth. But on the addiction on the software side uh, and the internet side in particular, uh, we need to actually regulate this industry out of understanding. So it's very promising that you're saying that the government is kind of in some sense waking up to how uneducated it is and how much it needs to be educated. And, you know, and no, no um, money making machine is going to regulate itself because there's too much greed, hatred, and delusion that's involved. Well, those are like fundamental dimensions of um, ignorance, you know. Yeah. Greed is kind of misunderstanding what self-interest is because you can hoard everything and be a complete pauper emotionally. Uh, mm -hmm. And with hatred and othering and all of those kinds of ways in which we make somebody else the enemy, these are th what imprison us. So the liberation ultimately has to drill down to these core human capacities that say, I'm more important than something else. And then self-identify in a small way that puts us in a little bubble where we're afraid of everything else. It's my money, my body, my health, my children, mm -hmm. all protected, but everybody else, I don't care about them. This will not work because if we think of the world as one body and you think of each one of us, as a cell in the one body politic, however you want to frame it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Even the internet is kind of a model of interconnectedness mm -hmm. that we need, we can't have the heart and the liver go to war with each other over their self-interest. There's a right. larger self-interest at play. And so we do need a medical and public health orientation towards this that is actually capable of dealing with the exponential greed that's driving this, the so-called, you know, sort of uh, uh, surveillance capitalism, where, mm -hmm. you know, it is the behavior that's being sold, predictive behaviors in the future that's being sold. Well, I mean, the same way as we can't sell people, this is a, another form of slavery in a certain way. Yeah. Yeah, there's a, a different phrases I've seen some thinkers use, uh, limbic serfdom uh, or attentional serfdom that we are the uh, attentional serfs who we have a invisible labor job in the same way that there's the labor economy driving around uh, Ubers. We have, uh, we are all doing attentional labor because if you, this is actually Im Im important because if you think about um, the, pr the systems that produce the information that we used to get, and it was by all means not perfect. And there's all sorts of problems with the gatekeeping of a small number of channels. And we want to acknowledge all that. But at least there is some process. There is some journalists that theoretically went to a journalism school. There are some editors that had to um, have editorial judgment and hopefully go through the ranks of you know, some institution to figure out what was true or credible or worthwhile. You do a double fact check, you call for confirmation, you let the other team respond. You have all these practices. That was the system, the generator system of the information ecology that we're living in, that we were living in. And it costs money. Those journalists, you had to pay them $100,000 a year. That editor at the New York Times, you had to pay them $150,000 a year. Now, if you think about that process for generating the information that then 2 billion people are consuming every day. So you had that with the BBC and ABC and CBC, and the, you know, CBS, whatever it is. Now you compare that to each of us being given our five minutes of hate, our five minutes of outrage, and we will do that attentional labor for free. Instead of a journalist writing an article, we'll post someone else's article and, and as, a, as a sort of a useful idiot to be a driver. Like an, we're like an Uber driver for the attention economy. This is the attentional serfdom. We're doing free labor to get other people to look at stuff. So instead of the New York Times selling our attention to an advertiser, Facebook uses all of our decentralized emotional limbic reactions to sell that to advertisers. And because we're willing to do that for free, we're not having to be paid $150,000 a year to do that work, we're the dupes that are doing this. And the more there's the political anger and the tribalism and each one of our individual traumas, we, we talked about this in our, in our pre-call, there's this kind of trauma inflation we're also seeing, which is that each person, no matter what it is that they can't look away from, because that's their kind of traumatic thing, whether it's you know, fear on the right about Antifa. That's like the thing that they're worried about. And people on the left are like, what are you talking about? It's a fictional idea. On the right, you see, you click on one Antifa video of a bomb or some kind of violence going off in, uh, in Portland. Then you see Twitter says, oh, you must like 
you must like these kinds of videos. So it feeds you video after video after video after video of evidence of inflating. So it's taking this social growth hormone and inflating yeah. that trauma. So we see and feel more of it. So disproportionately our biases, we're all biased in human beings are biased in how we perceive the world, but we're now all biasing worse. And moreover in the inflated experience that I just got, all those people who don't see Antifa don't care about it. They saw none of it. So when I yell Antifa, Antifa, mm -hmm. The other side says, you're crazy. And, the other, and, then, and then we say, that side says, um, you're ignoring our lived experience. And then I don't feel met with dignity. But then on the other side, you have police brutality and you have people for whom that's their trauma or racial injustice. And they see video after video after video after video. And they see all of this stuff. And they hear people on the right saying, you're overblowing how big a problem those issues are in society, or here's the chart. And then they feel like their lived experience is being ignored. So you have our experiences that are being warped in what we feel and think and believe, and we're getting um, uh, uh, we're getting less dignity from the other side. And one of the things that I really like to promote some other groups that are doing fantastic work on this. We have a couple of podcast episodes we've done with. Uh, one group is called uh, Braver Angels, which does courageous conversations between different uh, the left and the right in, in this country. Um, and um, they host these really difficult conversations and, and find ways of bridging common ground. There's another group called More in Common. Um, and what More in Common studies is something called perception gaps. So perception gaps, oftentimes when people think about social media, they think and hear about conspiracy theories and disinformation and misinformation. And you, know, you and I, John, we're the smart ones. It's just only those other dumb people who fall for the disinformation. That's often how that disinformation conversation goes, right? No one ever thinks they're the one getting the, the warped information. But what, what this group found is that the more you use social media and media in general and political news, the worse your perception gaps are. Perception gaps are how accurately you are able to um, uh, estimate what the other side believes. So if people on the left who say, well, how many people on the right believe this sort of racist thing? And they would estimate a very big number, but the actual number is, is a lot smaller than what people would think. I'll give you a concrete example from their research. Um, if you ask Republicans, sorry, if you ask Democrats to estimate how many Republicans make more than $250,000 a year, and they'll estimate that more than a third of Republicans make $250,000 a year, but the actual number is only 2%. So we're trapped in a stereotype about that. And then if you ask Republicans, how many Democrats, what percentage of Democrats are LGBTQ? And they'll say a third of uh, Democrats are LGBTQ, but the actual number is 6%. So uh, we are all seeing um, these, these more skewed versions of the other side, the stereotypes. We always had stereotypes, but this is almost like we're getting stereotype inflation because we see the more extreme views of, of, of the other side. And the worst, uh, our perception gaps are, it's shown in the research, the bigger that they are, the more likely we are to view the other side as hateful, bigoted, and ignorant, because we don't understand how they, like how they, how they could possibly believe the things that they believe, because we're, we're overestimating how many people hold these views. And I want to give two explanations for why this happens on social media. The first is there's asymmetric participation from those with the most extreme political views. So if I have an extreme political view, I'm on social media more often. I'm looking at it more often, so I'm consuming more often, but I'm posting more often, right? Because think about the people who post the most, right? They're the ones with the more extreme views. All the moderate people are sitting there much more. They don't have as much of a, it's called the asymmetry of passion in the literature from my friend, uh, Rene Diresta. Um, so you have asymmetric sharing about the, the extreme stuff. And then when the extreme stuff gets posted, you also have more distribution and reach for that material. So on two counts, it's a double whammy of, of our perception gap getting skewed. We see more, uh, we see an asymmetric amount from the extreme voices. And then when they post, they dominate the airways for longer. When you bring this into the kids domain, they become snowballs because if you notice, if you go into Twitter and it says, in case you missed it, and it pulls back all the things from the last 48 hours that you might've missed. Mm. So naturally it goes back in time. If you think about a moment of drama or conflicts, like someone passes you on the freeway, you know, and you all the meditation and mindfulness teachers would say like, just how do you get through that moment? How do you just notice that you're getting hijacked and just let it go, right? And even if you don't let it go, the half-life of that person cutting you off on a freeway is pretty, pretty quick. But now if you think about it, the half-life of something happening now in social media land is it doesn't just fall off because Twitter says, oh, hold on, let's go back in time to the last 72 hours, pull back all of the drama and then put that at the top of your newsfeed. So we've extended the half-life and then we've allowed more people to pile on. And then that also extends the half-life. 
And now you take that into the kid's domain and you have a kid who will say something or they'll make a mistake, they'll put a comment in or something like that. And then the entire school gets lit up in a drama snowball. And next thing you know, you know, you get just intense amounts of social pressure and anxiety among kids because you know, it's one thing when it's happening in the adult political landscape, but it's also happening for kids. And it's really not built for, for children. I mean, people should so just let's really say, get, yeah. Can I interrupt you? Let's just Please. say that, okay, you, have, you, are the, you are the physician who has absolutely nailed the diagnosis and the etiology, the source of it, okay? Uh, now, what is the prognosis and what is the treatment plan? Uh, for, for that, I mean, for just what you articulated, if you were running the show, what would you recommend to the people who actually have potentially enough power, because power is a very kind of up for grabs question at the moment, even in terms of regulating anything in the United States, never mind globally, but what would be a few of the practical recommendations to that would actually be possible to do given our surveillance capitalist you know dominance to actually liberate ourselves from the greatest toxicity for the sake of the children and and future generations i mean is that a fair question even or is that something that you know has to come from a deep collective investigation that will involve millions of us with some people of course articulating the problem more um, we obviously want to get to solutions and, um, we, um, what we're dealing with is such a multifaceted and, um, it, to give people a sense of what you're asking, it, um, I think of it as we, we have all been implanted with a brain implant. It's funny, you know, people worry about Neuralink and Elon Musk, you know, building this AI to plug into our brains and what's going to happen when we have this brain implant. Well, we actually already have a brain implant and it's been in there for about 10 years and it has changed and rewired the pathways of how our brains are. Think about someone who undergoes um, Alzheimer's and one of the things people say is they, it ch when, when you change your identity, that's when things start to, get to feel weird with a person who's really changed. If you have a brain implant, it starts to change our societal identity, change our, our inner identity. When it comes to children, it's not just oh, the likes and they're addicted, it's actually changing the identity structures that they're holding, right? What they're getting validated for, what they're not getting validated for. Um, and so I'm just saying this because the depth of the thing we're talking about, how would we fix it, is essentially how would you um, safely reverse or undo or liberate a mind from this virtual brain implant of the social media thing plugging into how our whole society is wired together? And it's a hard question to answer at the comprehensive scale that we're interested in answering. We do want to answer it at that comprehensive scale. We want to liberate our identity. We want to liberate our attention. We want to liberate um, our, our social conversations from tribalism. We want to liberate epistemology and truth-seeking, not tribalism, where I agree with something, not because I think it's true or I've investigated it, but because someone with my colored t-shirt on and my political tribe is saying it and they sound like me, so I'll agree with it. And if it's a different person, I won't agree we need to liberate our minds to actually be the kind of wise people that we're capable of, which is why I think so many of the insights that we need are coming from, you know, the community of everyone listening to this and everyone is on this call and everyone is in the broader, you know, uh, engagement that we're, we're talking about. And as you know, and we talked about before in, in the pre-call, you know, liberating your mind is hard enough as it is in a lifetime um, without any of the, the social media and technology issues. Um, but this is, this is adding a, another layer to that. The interesting thing is, you know, I look at some of Byron Katie's work and it's like, if you can question some of these beliefs, how fast can something change? If you can get underneath that thing you're so sure of, and you can change pretty fast, but that process is, is really hard to get people to go through. And it's a lifelong process of, of gaining the kind of uh, awareness that, that, that let, we, let me so, say, let me say in response, because, um, yeah we're asymptotically approaching ending this conversation, but it should really go on for hours. Yeah. Uh, speaking of uh, Byron Katie and MBSR and so forth, that um, in the past 40 or 50 years, what we've discovered in um, of science 
is that we can actually train people in meditative awareness in one way or another and in deep inquiry the way she does so that we actually can transform as individual people how we interface with reality starting with our own body our own thoughts and emotions our own uh, sense of inner and outer and reality actually that these really are very ancient but incredibly powerful but also modernized perspectives that actually offer liberation not just for one in a million people who devote their entire life to it uh, but you know mindfulness is being taught in schools now globally in a way that was never even conceivable never predicted before. that and I just looked it up the, the NIH just uh, as I understand in the past year has spent more than um, $120 million on mindfulness research. When I started MBSR in 1979, the idea that the National Institutes of Health, uh, the government body that funds you know, the, the enormity of the scientific research in the United States, that would devote any amount of money to uh, the in research on the uh, medical and, and brain effects of uh, Buddhist meditative practices. Mm. It was more likely that the accelerating, expanding universe that was triggered by the Big Bang would come to a grinding halt and collapse back on itself. The probability of that event, extremely, extremely small. The probability that NIH would fund research in meditation, smaller. And it's happened in a period of 40 years. That's a kind of just a kind of, I think, indicator of what kind of catalytic potential we are mm -hmm. sitting on, where because the stakes are so high, we need to actually instantiate whatever it is that we mean by wisdom on every conceivable level that you're pointing to, not, not uh, sort of uh, uh, kind of diminishing in any way, shape, or form the enormity of the disease and the mm -hmm. pathology of a lot of this, but if humans created it, humans can change it. And the, the whole meditative world is described sometimes by the word Dharma in Sanskrit, D-H-A-R-M-A. -A. Now the real root meaning of the word Dharma it's spoken of as the, the teachings of the Buddha, but it also means lawfulness. Hmm. And I think what we're challenged, challenging ourselves to do is come up with a certain kind of understanding of the the lawfulness that would be required to uh, give humanity a chance for another 10,000 years or even mm -hmm. generations. And mm -hmm. it's that, uh, that essential that we do that work, as Byron Katie called it, we do the work. Right. So I think we've demonstrated that it's possible to go to scale with this and not have it be a a kind of new age, you know, magical thinking kind of thing that yep. a few people did. The idea that meditation would make its way into mainstream medicine, 50 years ago, it was, it was like the, the Visigoths are at the gates of Western civilization about to tear down the citadel. And now it's like meditation, of course it belongs in medicine, right. yoga too, for that matter. So I right. just want to sort of um, strike a note for, um, the potential for a catalytic optimism at scale to make this stuff happen that where everybody contributes their own deep embodied wisdom. And maybe we'll be too busy to be on social networking at all. So, I mean, I, I don't do social networking anymore. I have a Twitter account because someone was tweeting as me 12 years ago and I was told <laughs> legally that I should make sure that I owned the account, you know, but, but it's not like it's, as all bad, but it would be tremendously liberating if we could actually have our analog selves, not just back, but discover what the full potential of that is. And I don't think we should give up on that kind of uh, um, annihilation of our analog humanity, but no, learn not, to yeah. use our technologies in the service of that humanity. And, Completely. you know, just say one more thing about your friend Yuval Noah Harari, you know, that he wrote this book, 21 Lessons for the 21st Century, and Bill Gates actually reviewed it for the New York Times, and he says, well, you know, what's his take-home message? He said, well, it's in the final chapter, it's 
meditation. It's mindfulness. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, because he practices that very, very intensively, although he doesn't want to foist it on other people as the answer to all life's problems, because it isn't. But the fact is that uh, this is something that's entered the mainstream in such a way that it may be that if we don't understand what it means to be human in the next five or 10 years, and, and from a very, you know, sort of non- artificial intelligence way, but a really emotionally intelligent way uh, and somatically and socially intelligent way, connect in a deep level around this as a common humanity, as the, the all hands on spaceship earth, that we, you've used the phrase many times, I don't like to repeat it, but we're toast. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The stakes are that high. And I do Absolutely. think it's a love affair. I think we need to think of it as a love affair. I mean, I, I you know, I've, in the few times that we've crossed paths, I, I feel the, the, the pain of your awareness of this as if you're carrying something for the whole world. And the movie is in some sense been an incredible vehicle for unburdening that so that it's a much more uh, distributive yeah. responsibility because ultimately this is the ultimate distributive responsibility. It's for all of us and meditative awareness. It's not like you have to acquire awareness. We're born with awareness. We just don't know how to access our awareness. Right. Well, that's what's so amazing about it is in your work and, and those of our, this community, it's what is being taught is not, it's just adjacent. It's something, it's a place you can always point your mind to. I mean, it's this sort of adjacent possible that all you have to do is sort of be taught and trained how to do that. And you asked, you know, what would be, um, you know, sufficient to the scale of the problem is I think something closer to the German or Scandinavian concept of Bildung or uh, lifelong um, uh, conscious development, that there's a sort of, a society sees its responsibility in being able to provide the mechanisms for a lifelong development of consciousness, moral consciousness, emotional consciousness, um, uh, communication consciousness. And that starts with meditation training early. That would be what you're, what you're talking about. And last time we talked, I don't know if you have your graph, but you should literally show there's an exponential curve of mindfulness in your profession uh, being accepted, right? That's it. Can you see it? This is the yep. papers in the medical and scientific literature uh, per year since 1980, uh, the number of papers per year. Uh, and it's up through 20. 20 now and even during the pandemic it did not uh, decrease it's still going exponential a little higher than it was in 20, 2019 but again this is the improbable event come to right. actuality it's actually happening and and so where exactly. i wanted to go with this is and to connect a few threads that you've touched on in this call is um you know the you talked about einstein and and well you talked about the inability for us to anticipate exponential curves right einstein talked about one of the humans, things humans are not built to get our minds wrapped around is exponential curves and we always in our work at the center for humane technology use eo wilson's problem statement that the fundamental problem of humanity is we have paleolithic minds and emotions we have medieval institutions and we have godlike accelerating technology yeah. And you can't have the power of, uh, of gods uh, without the wisdom, love, and prudence of gods, the consciousness uh, and awareness. Not that each of us should you know, be some kind of superhuman, but if you have a Zeus-like power and you don't know it, then you bump your elbow and you accidentally scorched half of earth and you didn't even realize what you were doing. And in general, technology has been giving us um, these exponential powers. Um, and I think that uh, one of the things that when you think about, if that's the problem statement, the solution is the awareness to wield where the, the consciousness we have to have has to be above the level of power that we're wielding. Because if you were, if it is below that, then the power and surface area of what's going to be impacted is always going to be greater than what you know. So in a sense, you're always bumping your elbow into something or scorching something and you just don't see it until you wake up later and you gave kids mesothelioma or lead in the water or DDT or, you know, the technology screwing up mental health. And you find out later. So in general, we need to have the consciousness be above the technology. That's, that's the key that we have to have. And a, and a society built for lifelong human development of consciousness being growing at that scale and technology and powers always being kind of underneath or given sort of inside of the framework of the level of consciousness that we have. Think about rites of passage in earlier communities where you, you want to make sure you don't give off all the secrets 
of life to anyone. You wait until someone has proven that they're ready for that next phase. Exactly. And I think that entire cultural strategy is um, what we're needing um, as we deal with all these, these issues. This is so right on. I mean, it's so uh, right on point. Uh, it turns out in Sanskrit and in all these uh, meditative traditions, the word development is bhavana. That's the word that describes meditative practices, bhavana, mm -hmm. development. We're, 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 we're putting our shoulder to the wheel of our own human development. And that is what's liberative. And we need each other for it because we're only capable of seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching, knowing to a degree. We need each other to show us our blind spots. Exactly. You've been doing that, you know, to, to a gigantic degree <laughs> with all of your work. And the, the, our gratitude for that is huge. But I think we need to actually recognize that the marriage of these kinds of meditative practices brought into the mainstream of our world and of our reality and of our economics. Mm -hmm. uh, and of our politics. So we have mindful politics, mindful economics, a mindful technology. And it doesn't mean that everybody will all think the same thing, but there'll be limits to what, how we're constrained for the sake of the whole, because if right. the heart just succeeds at the expense of the bones and the, and, and the muscles and the heart and the liver, you're dead. And right. that's what we most need to avoid is not just being dead, but actually having a life that's worth living, that's meaningful, that's really mm -hmm. free to explore the deep dimensionality of um, how beautiful it is to you know, be human mm -hmm. on this planet at this particular moment. We wouldn't do too well on Venus and we wouldn't do too well even though there are sort of uh, robots there on Mars. So, and we don't have a planet B in spite of uh, Elon Musk or, you know, uh, or so, um, you know, it's just, I think a profound, um, I I'm feeling very inspired by having this conversation with you and just knowing you're on the planet, Tristan, and <laughs> oh, you, you know, what you devote yourself to and how many friends, and I've met many of them. I mean, many of the people that, uh, were in the social dilemma have sat rich meditation retreats with us. So right. there's something happening that needs to actually ignite passion in all of us for healing what's wrong, for naming it, for healing it, and for actually discovering, uncovering, and recovering what's most important in our humanity. And yeah, it's an exactly. ongoing conversation. It's not like we've solved anything at all. We've no, just exactly. aimed something. But it's really nice to see uh, that there are at least 600 people that are participating in this kind of thing. And it's really, let me just say, addressing you all, that it's about every single one of us in some sense mm -hmm. taking responsibility and actually Completely. maybe, you know, understanding if your phone has become your enemy in a certain way, bring mindfulness to your relationship to your phone and assert a certain kind of sovereignty over your own life because mm -hmm. no one else is going to do it for you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, completely. And what was one thing just last to add to that is one thing I love about putting this primacy on mindfulness is it also speaks to humility, because if you're mindful that you're wielding a power greater than what your current level of awareness is, it has you stop and actually not necessarily actuate, right? And then you can apply that lesson across everything. Like maybe I shouldn't be sharing something about COVID and how that's going to be this or that if I don't really know the difference between a virus and a bacteria or how vaccines work. Mm -hmm. If we shared with our power the level of our awareness, I, I love that the, putting the primacy on awareness also implies where we put humility. And um, anyway, I just love everything that, that you said, John. Uh, and I'm, I'm just honored to do that. I know we're okay. wrapping up the conversation, but this is just such a, a, a fantastic. Uh, well, thanks uh, for the opportunity, to do this with you. and um, and I look forward to a much much more. And just want to give a, a shout out to all of the people that work at the. Center for Humane Technology and everything that's on your website. I've spent quite a bit of time on it just kind of uh, in preparation for this call it just to sort of drill down a little bit deeper and it's just profound. And I think we need to, in some sense, recognize that this, this whole engagement and everything having to do with Wisdom 2.0, uh, mindfulness, meditative awareness in all forms uh, and the work that you're doing, it's actually a love affair. It's, mm -hmm. it's, 
it's a love affair with what's deepest and best in us as human beings. And, uh, and it's also a radical act of sanity to, mm. to align ourselves in this kind of a way at this particular point in time, or we're basically sleepwalking off the edge of the abyss. And I don't think that's alarmist at this particular moment nope. in time. Uh, and there are many, many ways that this healing needs to come about. And as I said, I mean, we need all hands on deck, I would say, on planet Earth. Nobody is a secondary to this engagement. And, you know, we need to take care of each other. And we can do it. 100%. We can do it. Tristan. Yeah, that's what we're doing. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank this you, John. Was, thank this you, was Michelle. a lot of fun. Um, <laughs>